Right. So well, it's it's absolutely lovely to see some names I recognise here, some faces I recognise, and I'm really grateful for having been invited to to give this lecture. It's a very long time since I've spoken to Colas, actually. Last time, of course, was in person. So what I'm going to speak on tonight is something, it's a project that um, we did fairly recently, 2018 to 19 in MOLA. And it's one that's very close to my heart. Um, David's already alluded to it. Um, and this is a new initiative which MOLA started back in 2018, which is the MOLA Academy of Archaeological Specialist Training. The idea being that we wish to share the knowledge that professionals had gained over their careers with people who are non-professional archaeologists and to pool our resources and work together to look at sites which have been perhaps buried for a long time in the archive and hadn't for various reasons been published. And so this was the first course that we ran and we had about 15 people join the course from all sorts of different backgrounds including students from UCL and retired people, frogs. We had a number of, uh, a, a really nice range of people working with us together to look at one particular site. And the site that we were looking at is in America Square. And this is, it's down quite near the tower. And you can see here, it was excavated by what was then the DUA in 1987 and the site code was ASQ, America Square 87. And you can see here more or less where the site is and you can see the um, extent of the excavations that was carried out. Now for various reasons it wasn't possible to publish the later sequence of finds and I happened upon these completely by accident one day when I was looking for a, a site with a, a similar site code. And I noticed a number of boxes which said porcelain, porcelain was written on the labels. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what's in those. Pulled them out and they were packed with Chinese porcelain and English porcelain. It just so happened that on that day, we had a member of the Oriental Ceramic Society and a member of the English Cer Ceramic Circle, both in the archive. And they got terribly excited looking at this material. And I thought then, which was several years ago, this is something we really need to look at properly because it's a significant site. There's something interesting going on here. So that's the position of the site. That's where the site is. And here, if you look at this extract from Google Maps, you can see the arrow pointing down to the actual location of the excavation. As you can see, not very far north of the tower at all. Now, there, Preliminary work on the excavation was carried out in under the railway viaducts that lead to Fenchurch Street Station. Now, there's part of the Roman wall runs through there, and there were there was a scattering of Roman finds. It wasn't very rich um, as far as the Roman finds were concerned, and there wasn't anything very much happening in that specific area until the 17th century, the later 17th century. Um, we did have a series of dumps deposits from mid 17th through to the 19th century. But the important thing, the main feature of the site, which is of interest, is um, a medieval stone culvert, which was cut through part of the Roman wall. And this culvert was remained in place up to the 19th century. Now, Within that culvert, we found a huge quantity of finds. It was just stuffed. It had been used as a drain and it was stuffed with finds. Lots and lots of ceramics and there were other finds as well, animal bones, glass, small finds, etc. And so that is what my talk is focused on. It's this one assemblage that was recovered from that medieval culvert, which continued um, to be used as a, 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 as a drain through into the 19th century. Now, this map here, this extract from Ogilby and Morgan, we're looking at the date 1667 to 79. You can see where the blue arrow at the top of the screen is, you can see that area 
is that is the pinpoint where this particular assemblage was recovered from. And you can see there is no buildings actually on the site at that date. We have to move through 100 years or so later before we get something happening there. And this is the America Square project. And it was designed by George Dance the Younger. And the idea was that they wanted to regenerate the area and encourage trade with the colonies, the American colonies. And they wanted to bring it rather more upmarket than it was at the time. So Dance was commissioned by Sir Benjamin Hammett to develop high quality um, housing. And he, they wanted to attract the better off citizens and the merchants who were involved in the America trade. That's what they were aiming at. They wanted to make this a desirable area and to encourage the American trade. So in fact, it was one of the earliest planned residential developments in London. And you can see here um, on an extract from Horwood's map, the development consisted of the square of 16 houses, that's at the top in the middle of the screen, America Square. And then there was a crescent south of that, which had 11 houses. And then to the south of that, there was a small circus with 10 houses. And then there were various other subsidiary buildings in between stables and so on, and storage buildings, etc. So there you are, that is the actual development that took place in the late 18th century. And that is where we're focused on, America Square. And the one building <clears throat> that we're most interested in is the large building at the top left of the square, number 16. That is where, in the basement, that was where the, um, the culvert was found. And that's, that's where all the finds that we recovered had been dumped. So number 16, America Square. There you go. And here you can see on the Rhinebeck panorama of 1804, again, you can see um, sort of in the middle of the, of the screen moving towards the right there, you can see the circus and the crescent and then the square. And so you can see how the area was obviously being made to look quite fashionable and desirable. And indeed it did attract wealthy people, persons such as Nathan Mayer Rothschild. He lived at number 14 America Square. And there is a photograph here of the, the house in which Rothschild lived um, sometime after he had been there at the beginning of the 20th century. So you can see the sort of people who were being attracted to live in this new development in London. Now this interesting sketch of about 1850, number 16 is the large building on the corner that you can see in the center, slightly towards the right hand of that image. That's the house that we're interested in. That's the house that contained in its basement all the finds that we're going to be looking at in this uh, presentation. So, I'm going to show, run through the pottery, so I hope those of you who aren't so keen on pottery will now become entranced by all these wonderful things that I'm going to show you. And this is what the evening class, the, the masked group, were actually focused on working through with us. And they did all the hard work of piecing together and sorting out all the different types of ceramic. And I hope they learned a bit about what sort of ceramics were being used at the time. But as you can see there, it was a considerable amount. We had over 3000 sherds and you've got 51 kilos of pottery and at a rough estimate about 467 individual pots. So that is quite a large assemblage. And the important thing about this assemblage is that it has a sort of overall coherence that suggests it was generated um, over a short space of time, the sort of thing that I've referred to in the past as um, a general household clearance. 
there wasn't a lot of residual or intrusive pottery. There were parts of sets of vessels in there. There was a good coherence in the date and in the type of pottery that was being uh, recovered. So we look at this and think that this is in fact generated over a short space of time, possibly even as a single event and by a single household. So that sort of assemblage is rather important and therefore we were really glad to devote some attention to it. So just as a rough guide, this is a breakdown of the, uh, the main types of pottery. As you can see, creamware comes way out at the top, but very close to that, you've got Chinese porcelain and those two wares dominated the assemblage. We've also had a, a reasonable amount of white salt glazed stoneware and everything else is there's a good scattering of different types of wares, but it's the creamware and the Chinese porcelain which were dominant. And those are the pieces which are particularly of interest to us. So here's the creamware. So you've got 1,249 shirts. You've got a lot of it. Creamware isn't wonderfully exciting to look at. It was developed by Wedgwood in, uh, well, no, it wasn't developed by Wedgwood. Wedgwood refined it, but it was developed by other potters working in the Midlands in the 1740s initially. And in the 1760s, Wedgwood worked on making the, the color of the glaze much paler. So it was, a, it was a very fashionable wear at the time in the late 18th century. And people did acquire a lot of this for dinner services, tea services and the like. And when we had been through and sorted out all the creamware, this is how it broke down. Way out the top, we have plates, mostly dinner plates, some other plates, dessert plates, tea plates, but mostly dinner plates. And then we had a large number of bowls, dishes and chamber pots. So those were the main forms that were found. And then you can see there was a whole range of other different types of ware as well that were being um, uh, used in this uh, and discarded in this group. Things associated with dinner services and with tea services particularly. So we worked out that there were probably at least 46 dinner plates in creamware. And you can see they're fairly standard designs. The one at the back of the slide there, that's called the Royal Pattern or Queen's Pattern. And it, it's based on silver designs. And you can see that that plate has a lot of cut marks, knife cut marks in the base. That plate was probably well used by the time it was discarded. Obviously it's discolored and it's crazed uh, because it's been buried for a couple of hundred years, but it's also been well used before it was thrown away. Not many of the plates were marked, but you can see in the inset at the bottom, at least one of them had been made by Wedgwood and you can see the Wedgwood impressed stamp, back stamp on the, the bottom of the plate there. We also had some octagonal plates with molded designs around the rim. And then we had various bowls and dishes and you can see that base there at the bottom and the sherd is sort of flying off um, at two o'clock from it. And that's a sort of fluted bowl which would be used for serving perhaps in, uh, as part of a dinner service. You've got the base of an egg cup beside that. And then you've got dishes and tea bowls and various other forms. So the creamware, it's fashionable. It doesn't look very wonderful now because it is, as I said, it's all discolored, it's crazed, it's been buried, it's got a bit messy. Um, but when it was new, this would have looked rather nice. Not exotic, but it would have been fashionable. Certainly when in the last part of the 18th century, it would have been fashionable. Creamware gradually goes out of use in the uh, sort of second quarter or so of the 19th century, um, as you've got pearlware and whitewares taking over from it. But at the end of the 18th century, this is still a desirable kind and very well represented across the archeological record. Desirable ware, fashionable. Some nice pieces in the creamware collection, 
what you've got here is two views of a drainer. Now this would fit over a dish and it would be used for draining. You could have fish on that and the juices would drain through into the bottom of the dish or vegetables and so on. So that's part of a, um, a drainer that would have been used as a in, in, in the dish service. And then you've got some ladles. The ladles, I always love finding ladles, actually ceramic ladles, but we've got at least two of them. I think there possibly were three ceramic ladles. And you can see that they've got those, these fancy handles, the two handles there, there. So they would be used for serving from terrines and such like, and for serving soups and so on. Now there's one of, one of my favorite bits here. It's a, a nice little sauce boat. It's lost its handle. Again, it's derived from a silver shape, part of the very sort of the, the way that they liked to do. Creamware did mirror vessels that were made in silver as, as part of the being sort of prevailing taste of the time. So this is a fairly simple but elegant design. This, this sauce boat, which would have been used for gravies and sauces during the meal times. And this, this is several views of a rather nice, large barrel shaped jug. And you can see it's got these um, molded ribs around the outside of the body. And the handle is a double overlapping handle there with nice molded um, terminals. And it's also got an applied spout and a drainer behind the spout. So it would have been used for stuff that they wished to to drain as they were pouring. It's quite a large vessel and rather nice. Not many jugs in the collection, but this is one of them. We did have rather a lot of these and we had the creamware chamber pots, about 19 different chamber pots in creamware, perfectly plain, simple, practical, vessels as you can see one illustrated in the um in, in, in the print there um exactly the same sort of vessel one of these rather cruel um 18th century satirical prints depicting an old an old lady looking for a flea um but the hang on to the idea of chamber pots because we have uh, rather more to hear about them in the future there's also um a nice little drug jar in creamware below that. And that another, is another story that we want to uh, emphasize as we go through this collection of finds. Now, I said that there was also white salt glazed stoneware. Now this started to be made <clears throat> in the 1720s and it goes through to roughly about the last quarter or so of the 18th century. Um, when it really dies a death and it's not really made beyond the 1780s. But we have here in this white salt glazed stoneware sherds from um, at least 45 chamber pots. So we had 19 in creamware and we've got 45 more, at least 45 more in the white salt glazed stoneware. So this is very interesting. So one begins to wonder, what are all these chamber pots doing in the uh, in this assemblage? We've also we've got a lot of dinner plates. We've seen that in the creamware, and now we've got these chamber pots, particularly in this one fabric. You can also see in the in this particular slide the inset at the bottom left a number of little drug pots, again. Um, picking up a theme which I showed in the previous slide. So perhaps health is something of an issue in this household and hygiene. Slightly more decorative, this is an upside down shot of the uh, of, of a nice bowl in pearlware. Pearlware starts being made in around the 17, the last quarter of the 18th century um, and it's basically like a creamware, but they have added a tiny bit of cobalt into the glaze, which makes it whiter than the cream colored glaze of creamware. And pearlware continues to be made into the second quarter of the 19th century. And you can see here 
that this particular bowl has been decorated with marbled slips of different colours. And this was the sort of thing that Wedgwood made in great numbers. This was fairly ordinary because it wasn't expensive to do this kind of decoration. It was relatively unskilled compared with painting. So we can see um, this is perhaps, you know, fairly ordinary, but pretty kind of bowl that we've got in the, the pearlware with marbled slip. Then we've got pearlware that's been painted with um, underglaze blue designs. Now here we begin to pick up a little bit more about the taste of whoever it was who was throwing all this stuff away. And we can see here, first of all, you've got on the one hand, you've got that, that dish, that saucer dish, which has a um, simple floral type decoration, little garlands around the rim, nothing very special, nothing very carefully painted. But the shirts from the other vessels, bowls, saucers, tea bowls, they are all decorated in underglaze blue with designs which are uh, derived from Chinese porcelain. They're fairly sketchy, they're not very carefully done at all, but they are popular at the time, at the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century. Chinese type decoration is all the craze, everybody wants it. You've got the Chinese porcelain itself coming in still in, in large quantities, and you've still got a huge influence exerted by the type of decoration that was executed on Chinese porcelain. And the English um, ceramic industries remained entranced with this for decades, centuries even. So here you can see some examples of this basic English sketchy Chinese type river scenes on these sherds here. And here's part of a saucer, fluted saucer with a scallop rim that's been um, decorated with a, with a Chinese, a European version of a Chinese river scene. You can see a little house there, the river with rocks in the river and sketchy trees and so on and grasses in there. Not at all carefully painted, not a highly skilled piece of work, but it still gives you an idea of the prevailing taste and the importance of the Chinese wares in what people were choosing to buy and, and put in their homes and, and what they were drinking their tea from, what they were eating their dinner from. Now we also have pearl wares which have transfer printed decoration and this is rather interesting. Um, here we have some sherds from tea bowls and a saucer decorated in the same pattern and these will date to the very end of the 18th century and it took me a while. I, I thought, oh, this, this pattern looks like a, a very popular pattern called the buffalo print. And you have a boy or, and a man looking at a buffalo. But I thought, it's not quite right, because there was something like a big sock sticking out in the front there. And in fact, oh, come on. There we go. There we go. Um, there it is. That's what that would have come from. It's a rare version of the popular buffalo print that was carried out with an elephant. So what you can see in the previous slide is part of the elephant's trunk. So that was rather nice to find that. And you can see how carefully the design has been executed on this particular print here, which is, I think, made at the same factory. We're not quite sure which factory made these um, this rare print, but um, clearly, Whoever was uh, living in number 16, America Square, had at least a small number of vessels which were decorated with this particular print. Now, there was some Tinglaze ware or Delft ware. It hasn't survived terribly well. It all's a bit manky and it's a bit difficult to get it clean. But what we've got here, at the end of the 18th century, at the beginning of the 19th century, this is the time when Tinglaze ware is really on the way out. It's got a lot of disadvantages. It 
breaks more easily than the refined earthenwares like creamware and pearlware and certainly Chinese porcelain. It cracks, the graze cracks. It's not very good for hot liquids. It's useless for hot liquids really. Um, and it's really had its day. So by the end of the 18th century, you're getting far fewer forms being made in tin glaze ware. So what we've got here is a drug jars and, and the complete examples are from the Museum of London's collections to illustrate what they would have looked like because we've got sherds from these types of vessels. We have part of a dinner plate there with a Chinese, surprise, surprise, Chinese style river landscape and another drainer, just as we had in the cream where we've got part of a drainer there with the perforations on the top, again, with a Chinese type design. And then we have black basalt ware. And this was developed as Egyptian black by Wedgwood in the middle of the 18th century. And it's a dry bodied stoneware, um, very fine body, and it's very good. And it was very much favored for teapots. Um, it was much better than, uh, well, tin glaze ware wouldn't have done for teapots. And the Chinese tended not to make teapots so very much. They used other vessels for serving tea. And teapots was a very European thing. It was an English thing. And what we find is very often you'll have households in England have Chinese porcelain or English porcelain vessels for drinking tea tea bowls, cups, saucers, jugs, etc. But they will use black basalt or some sort of refined stoneware for making the teapot because that kept the tea better. It kept it hot and it was much better for the tea. So we've got part of um, three teapots and two cream jugs in black basalt ware. And this is the most complete one of them. This comes from America Square assemblage. And you can see it's been decorated on the outside with these enameled garlands of flowers. And when that was new, that would have looked quite flashy. That would have been a nice pot. We also have um, part of a teapot in red stoneware. This is a glazed version. And you can see that the inset at the bottom shows you what that would have looked like when it was whole. It's got engine turned decoration on it. A cylindrical teapot, again, very much favoured alongside Chinese porcelain for use with your teawares. You'd have a stoneware teapot such as this. So we've got a number of teapots. And now for the sort of more utilitarian types of pottery. Here is um, part of a dish that was made in slipware. We know that slipware like this, which is inspired by Staffordshire type slipware of the 17th century and early 18th, and this was being made certainly in Iselworth um, in the late 18th and early 19th century, where it was called Welshware for some reason. And you can see it's combed slip and we had a number of large dishes that would have been used for serving. Perhaps not, this is not the sort of stuff that you would bring out for best. You would be using your creamware and your porcelain for best but possibly this would have been used perhaps in, in the kitchens um, by the servants and for more ordinary use. So we have um, three of these large dishes in Iselworth type slipware. We also have a small amount of brown salt glazed stoneware. There's four jars. The one that you can see illustrated here is not a very large jar. It would be about four inches high. And there was a mug as well. Not a lot of stoneware, not a lot of storage jars. That's one of the things that we didn't find very much of in this assemblage was storage vessels apart from things for pharmaceutical preparations. But larger storage vessels, things for the kitchen, seems to be largely missing. And then we're back to the chamber pots. We've got some um, Surrey Hampshire border redware and we've got one of these um, green glazed ones. These continued being made into the 18th century. They were started in the 17th and they continued into the 18th. But we have a number of the redware border pots as uh, chamber pots as well. So there's a small amount of borderware, red borderware particularly in the assemblage. Ordinary, utilitarian, everyday pottery for use in the household. And now for the Chinese porcelain. We have um, a very large number of sherds 
12,047 sherds of Chinese porcelain. It does break into small bits, but there's a lot of it. And if you look at the breakdown of the forms, plates are the most common type. And then we have tea bowls and saucers are also well represented, but plates were very much the, um, the main type. So here you are, you can see some of the examples. Now, these are all mid to late 18th century, very standard and not, you can see here the designs, they're not top quality, but you've got parts of different sets. Uh, these have got the same design on. So this would have been bought as a set. And there are overall about 92 plates. Here's another design. I'll just run through some of the different patterns. And you can see the typical Chinese designs with the river landscapes, which is so popular at this period, are, are, are featuring here. This one is a little bit better painted than the previous ones. And more of the same sorts of things. And yet more Chinese buildings uh, are plenty, rivers, rocks, trees. So you have a, a very good representation, 92 odd plates. You have some other designs as well, such as this baskets of flowers. And there was a more than one of these from that set in the, in the collection. And then here, this is a slightly later towards the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, um, part of a saucer. And this one is, is well painted. This is a nice piece. We've got some little fluted dishes and bowls. We've got fig figures, uh, uh, Chinese figures as well, not just river landscapes. And again, you can see the variety of, of quality that you have here in the collection. Some pieces are fairly well painted and some are knocked off quite quickly. We've got here a, a nice range of tea bowls. The one that you can see at the top that is the Tibetan Sanskrit um, Lanka or Om symbol. And we had a couple of tea bowls decorated with that. And then you want to below that has got a vase on it and a table. And then you're back to the river landscapes. This one here, this is, there were, there were a number of bowls with this. There were th three or four bowls with this. And this is the um, decorated with the Lungshi mushroom symbol, which is a symbol of prosperity and longevity. So we've got some of these designs. And then we've got some with enamel decoration. Now here, the, the shirts that you can see on the right hand side come from a tall straight sided mug or tankard. It's got underglaze blue decoration and it's got overglaze figures painted in Flammy Rose enamels. And the saucer on the left there has got gilding as well. So this is where we're getting into a little bit better quality Chinese porcelain, fairly standard blue and white wares. And here is the top um, of, the, of, of, of the, the ladder. These, there were several vessels decorated with this pattern. And this pattern, which was put on in China, um, is copying directly designs on, Dres on Meissen porcelain. Um, and so what you can see is a European type harbour scene with European figures in it, European buildings, ships and so on. And this is copied by Chinese decorators on coffee cups and tea bowls and saucers. And these are absolutely, this is, this is the expensive material from the collection. This is the good stuff. And here are some more examples. There's part of a saucer and parts of, of, of tea bowls. You can see the translucency of the tea bowl in the top right hand side of the screen. And these also are copying Meissen, um, again painted in China. This is European type of design. It's not a Chinese way of painting flowers at all. So again, this is your best quality material that you can see here with these beautifully painted flowers, very carefully done, tea bowls and saucers. We also had some English porcelain from about 27 vessels. We brought in Anton Gabjevich, who's a, a top uh, expert in English porcelain, and he helped us identify the different factories. So we have here from New Hall, um, uh, six saucers and five cups decorated with this transfer printed design. 
based on Chinese patterns. We have Worcester porcelain, um, lovely source boats here, dating into the, to the sort of third quarter of the 18th century. This is the other side of that particular source boat. Uh, and there's another one there from Worcester, a different source boat with a different pattern. They all have these weird names that uh, have been given subsequently to patterns on, on English porcelain. This is a favourite. This is called the bat pattern. And you can see that sort of peculiar ragged thing floating in the air beside, on, on the left of the vase of flowers is, is, is a bat based on Chinese way of, of representing bats. But this is Worcester porcelain. We've got Carfley in the Midlands here. This is another porcelain um, source boat with a floral design on it. Not so much on the Chinese side of things. We've got lower stoffed porcelain. This is transfer printed and it's um, uh, depicting the Good Cross Chapel, which was in the town of Lower Stoft. This dates to the 1770s. And we've got uh, another saucer from Lower Stoft. We've got the lid of a um, that would have gone on to a, a little model flower pot. That's actually supposed to depict an aloe, but all of the bits have fallen off. That's bow porcelain. And then we've got Bristol hard paste porcelain um, decorated with um, enamels, saucer and a couple of cups. So we've got a nice range of different English porcelain producers in the late 18th century represented in this collection alongside the Chinese porcelain. Some of it with Chinese type designs and some of it with more European or English taste decoration. So if we have a look down at the, a breakdown of the vessel forms, you probably won't be able to see this very clearly, but you can see what's coming up the top, the plates. Overall, this is all the wares. The plates are the most um, numerous form. Then the chamber pots. Then we've got bowls, dishes, uh, tea bowls, saucers, and those are the main ones. And then you've got a range of other little, little forms alongside as well. If you look at them, how they break down according to function, serving vessels, and that is mostly things for dining, come way up at the top, followed by sanitary or hygiene wares as your chamber pots, then the tea wares. So overall in this household, those are the things that are taking up most of the um, deposit, wares that we used in everyday life for eating, drinking, and the rest of it. Now we also had glass. There were at least 144 vessels in glass, and that included something like 40 cylindrical wine bottles. Some of them complete, most of them uh, not, as you can see in the photograph there, you've got the, the, the bases of several bottles, but we had at least 40 wine bottles. So obviously had a well-stocked cellar. We also had fragments of wine glasses. The complete glasses are in there as parallels. The broken bits are from the um, excavation itself. So we had a number of different types of glasses, drinking glasses. So at least 31 were represented. So it's a good number. And here are some more. You've got the lovely ones with the, these lovely faceted stems, which would have scintillated in the candlelight. And we have tumblers as well. And then we had a large number of pharmaceutical files. We had a lot of things for pre pharmaceutical preparations in ceramic, but we've also got pharmaceutical files. Um, at least 44 of these. And these bizarre things, the one on the right is a complete one. Um, and the what we had were fragments like those on the left. And they turn out that these are um, urinals for female use. And there were at least seven of these. Very unusual find, not something I've come across before. So as you can see, um, in the glass, we have vessels for serving drink, that's the wine bottles come out at the top, then the pharmaceutical and the drinking vessels. A number of other finds, interesting, we have um, a toothbrush, 
we have a, a, a handle, a scrubbing brush, and the thing particularly to notice in the center, that is the nozzle from um, a, 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 what's its name, thing for giving enemas. So we have back into the, the territory, a syringe for enemas, and we're back into the territory of health and hygiene. So how do we interpret all this evidence? How do we bring all this together? If you look at all the finds together, serving food is the largest proportion of all the finds. Health and hygiene and tea wares come close. And then we've got drinking vessels and serving drink. So basic household functions. What date was the deposit? Well, looking at all the finds together and using working out the terminus postquem and the terminus antiquem, we didn't have any clay pipes of the right date in here. There were a few clay pipes and they were all residual. There were no tiles. You can't date animal bone. Um, the pottery, the latest date for the pottery is 1800 to 1810, and the glass fits in that same sort of bracket. So the date that we came up with, the best date for the deposit having been um, dumped in this culvert was 1800 to 1810. So we're going to make some comparisons with deposits, similar types of deposits of that kind of date, end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. And one of them is, is that comes to mind for me is the King's Arms in Uxbridge High Street, where a large number of the ceramic vessels were dumped in the well in the courtyard of the inn, um, probably in the late 1780s or 1790s. And that consists of lots of creamware, including several sets, different sets. You can see uh, the similarities there. Um, Sauce boats, there's a mustard pot and a, and a pepper pot. Lots of serving vessels. You've got drinking mugs here because we've got an inn, of course. Um, we've got some of these creamware with marbled slips. So remember that we had some pearlware with marbled slip. We've also got English porcelain. Um, and you can see the bat print again from Worcester. And this is Worcester bird in a tree print. We've got lower stoffed porcelain. There was a nice range of English porcelain in this particular site. And there was also a lot of Chinese porcelain. Another good parallel comes from Spitalfields, a little bit closer to the America Square site, 24 Fort Street. There was at least 465 vessels in here. Again, we've got the back print. We've got lots of Worcester porcelain. We've got Chinese porcelain. And we know that the people who lived in this particular uh, house, we know their names. They were Joseph and Anne Graham and they were silk manufacturers and they moved out or rather Anne moved out, husband having died in 1824. And there's a lot of similarity between the kinds of wares which they were using and the ones that we found at America Square. So we're left, who deposited this stuff? Who did it belong to? Well, Three of the students carried out wonderful research and they found out. And this is all down to them, Annette, Amadeep and Stuart. They were the ones who found out who had deposited this, who lived in this house, number 16. The first person who lived there was a Samuel Gist or Gist. And he moved in there from 1770. He was a um, tobacco merchant, slave owner. And he moved out in 1787. Now our deposit's a bit later than that. The next person who moved in, this is the one we want to focus on. This is a chap called George Wolfe. He moves in in 1787. And he was born in Norway in 1736, and then he moved to England. And he had a business in banking, shipbroking with his brother Ernst. And he was importing goods from Denmark and Norway. And he had connections even with uh, uh, he was exporting China from the Midlands in England. So that's interesting. Now he moved, he married his second wife in 1786 and expanded his business with his son in, son Jens and his son-in-law. In 1787, 
the year he moved into number 16, he was appointed cons Danish consul by George III. So he moved into 16 in number 16 America Square in that year. He also had another house in Streatham called Ballam House, but this was his main residence, his London residence. He was very well connected socially. Apparently there were accounts of him being extremely well dressed, loving entertaining, loving books, having lots of people round to his house. He was a close friend of John Wesley and he was an executor of Wesley's will life governor of the London Hospital, and he gave to various charities in, in, generously. But there was a lot of problems in his family. He, he lost three grandchildren, three infants. His wife died in childbirth while he was living in number 16. Um, the Danish government confiscated his fleet that he was using for his business because they said he shouldn't be the uh, consul. His brother died in 1808, and he stopped being consul after the British had attacked Copenhagen in 1807. In 1808, he moved out of number 16, and he died 20 years later in Streatham, in Ballam House. So 1808 is the date which fits within that bracket that we've been looking at. The subsequent owners or, or, or residents of the house Frederick Heisch and his family moved in in 1808. He was a, a, a merchant of, of, of Russian hemp, Russia, or hemp. Now, what we had to think of, were the uh, finds that we excavated belonging to Gist who, or Gist, who'd moved there out in 1787? No, because the stuff that was later than that, and it has a coherence to the assemblage, it looks like Wolf is far more likely. It's not likely that the person who moved in in 1808 would have brought with them loads of material that then they threw away in the basement. So Wolf, George Wolf, the Danish consul, is the one who is most likely to have been the, the person who generated this. Now, he lived there 21 years. He threw out 101 plates, 71 chamber pots, 78 bowls and dishes, 58 tea bowls and cups, 42 saucers and saucer dishes, 28 ointment pots and four sauce boats, plus 40, 43 wine bottles rather than 40, 12 wine glasses, 15 tumblers, and 44 med medicine files and seven urinals. That's quite a large amount of material, and it gives you a really good glimpse of what this person's life was really like. A person who did a lot of entertaining, who had a lot of sickness in their family. So here we have these snapshots, the entertaining, the tea bowls, um, the teacups, the coffee cups, the sauce boats, the plates, the sort of things that would have been used in the home. Perhaps these plainer wares would have been used by the servants. And certainly we've got the, the well-stocked cellar with wine that would have been used and enjoyed. And then we have, of course, all the, uh, the very large number of chamber pots, of course, without mains, drainage, et cetera, et cetera. You, this is the main way of, of, of dealing with this particular aspect of human life. But we do have a lot that were thrown away here. Plus we have all these medicinal things uh, that relate to illness um, within the home. So this, snapshot is this is really uh, to me a very exciting site um, a fascinating one and I always find it really wonderful if you can pin down name a person we can't prove a hundred percent that George Wolfe owned all this stuff and that when he moved out in 1808 this is what he did he had to downsize his family his business was had gone down the, the tubes his family was smaller. He moved to a house which was probably already well stocked with stuff and he had to get rid of things. And that seems to be the best explanation for this one particular exciting assemblage. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, uh, thank, 